All right. Um, I want to read you a letter this morning. It's a letter from um, it's a letter from a communist, actually, and um, it's a letter to his fiance. And it's a breakup letter. He's breaking off the engagement, and and um, this communist wrote this letter to his fiance. The fiance gave the letter to her pastor, and the pastor sent it to Billy Graham, and Billy Graham published this. <clears throat> We communists have a high casualty rate. We're the ones who get shot and hung and lynched and tarred and feathered and jailed and slandered and ridiculed and fired from our jobs and in every other way made us uncomfortable as possible. A certain percentage of us get killed or imprisoned. We live in virtual poverty We turn back to the party every penny we make above what is absolutely necessary to keep us alive. We communists don't have the time or the money for many movies or concerts or T-bone steaks or a decent home or new cars. We've been described as fanatics. We are fanatics. Our lives are dominated by one great overshadowing factor. The struggle for world communism. We communists have a philosophy of life which no amount of money could buy. We have a cause to fight for, a definite purpose in life. We subordinate our our petty personal selves into a great movement of humanity And if our personal lives seem hard or our egos appear to suffer through subordination to the party, then we are adequately compensated by the thought that each of us in a small way is contributing to something new and true and better for mankind. There is one thing in which I am dead earnest and that is... The communist cause. It is my life. It is my business, my religion, my hobby, my sweetheart, my wife, my mistress, my bread and meat. I work at it daytime and dream of it at night. Its hold on me grows, not lessen as time goes on. Therefore, I can carry on a French. Therefore, I cannot carry on a friendship, a love affair, or even a conversation without rela- relating to the force which both drives and guides my life. I evaluate people, books, ideas, and actions according to how they affect the communist cause and by their attitude toward it. I've already been in jail because of my ideas, and if necessary, I'm ready to go before the firing squad. A universal problem in the church today is commitment, is the lack of commitment. Whether to serve in some capacity or whether to change our lives, it's the problem. There are many There are many that wants to be a part of the Christian party. However, not many are willing to make the commitment that it takes. The communist that I'm, that his letter here, the communist that, um, or the commitment that this communist is referring to uh, may sound extreme. But actually it's nothing different than what Jesus taught. Well, the commitment's nothing different than what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't teach communism. But the commitment is nothing different than what Jesus taught. And this brings me back to the old question. If Jesus walked the earth today, whose church would he attend? (laughs) Or if Jesus was a pastor today, uh, what would his church look like? I'm not too sure. (laughs) I'm not too sure that we would want to know. It may force us to consider... If we've been serving Jesus or if we've been serving the church. I want to turn to Luke 14 this morning and, and you are um, 
welcome to turn there. Everything, I have the scripture on the screen this morning, but everything this morning will be out of Luke 14. So if you'd like to turn there, that's fine. Uh, I always encourage you uh, to always get a bulletin back there. It has the scripture in it for, for the message and never take my word. <laughs> Never take my word as the last word. Always test everything with the scripture. This evening, pull out Luke 14 and read it. Always test everything with the scripture. Well, we find in Luke 14 that uh, where Jesus is knee deep in his ministry here. And I just wanted to look and see if his actions and his teachings, how they would translate, how they would translate in today. And uh, Luke 14, 1 through 6, we're going to start there. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them saying, Which of you have a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit? Will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. Now, <laughs> it was working so well, Steve. <laughs> now, at first glance, let's think about it. If Jesus had a church... If Jesus had a church today, at first glance, we would think, wow, with Jesus' healing powers, he would have an absolute mega church. There would just be people coming from everywhere to be in his church. And I, th I think mainly because of the miracles that Jesus could do. Because, come on, come on, we are motivated by what we can get. Plain and simple, aren't we? How many times have you said or that, that you've heard people say, well, I go to that church because they can do this for me. I go to that church because they can do this for me or for my kids or, you know, we, we are motivated by what we can get. So I would think that Jesus would attract a large amount of people. However, then he begins to teach. Luke 14, 7 through 14. So he told the parable of those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places saying to them, when you are invited... By anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place. At least one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come to say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin, and then you being with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place. So that when he who invited you comes, <laughs> he may see, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. When you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Wow. Should we, should we always think of ourselves? As the least in the room. Think about that thought. Should you always think of yourself as the least in the room? If, if you are in Christ, you are the servant of all. If you are in Christ, you are the servant of all. Christ served us all. Christ did everything for us. Everything. Everything. And that's number one in our sermon notes. And it's in your bulletins. If you don't have them, they're back there. So how would this translate? How would this translate today in, in Jesus' church? <laughs> there you go. Would it be a custom? Would it be a tradition on every Sunday to offer somebody your seat. And you know what I'm talking about when I say your seat. Huh? Come on. You know what I'm talking about when I say your seat. Sit in my seat. Sit in. Take my parking spot out there. My parking spot that I parked at for the last 20 years. But you can have it. You can have it. Take my parking spot. Take my seat. 
How well would that go over? Being a servant, being a servant of all sounds, sounds good on paper, but let me tell you, it's hard. It's not easy to do. What would happen if you, if you said, okay, I'm going to transform my life. I'm going to always think of myself as the, as the servant as Jesus is the servant. I want to think of myself as the least in the room. I'm going to be that servant. What is going to be the first thing that's going to happen to you? If you're going to be the servant of all, what's going to be the first thing that's going to happen to you? You're going to be taken advantage of, aren't you? Somebody is going to take advantage of you. What do you think about that? Are you going to still be the servant? And then somebody else is going to take advantage of you. And somebody else is going to take advantage of you. Still okay with it? How many times, how many times have we taken advantage of the grace of Jesus Christ? But he's still the servant of all. So what would you think? Be all right with it? As the mega crowd gets a little smaller. Luke 14. 12 through 14. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or, or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So what is this? What is this instruction that Jesus has given? So if you're going to have a dinner, if you're going to put on a dinner, you're not to invite your family and friends. You're in, you're, you are to invite those who cannot repay you. Now this would certainly change Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, wouldn't it? <laughs> now I'm not, I don't think that Jesus is saying here that you can't have dinner with your family and friends. But the question I want to ask this morning is, what's the ratio? What's the ratio between the dinners that you prefer, prepare for your family and friends and those that can repay you and the dinners that you prepare for those who can't? What's the ratio? That's... Uh, that's number two. That's number two in our sermon notes. How often do we provide for the needy compared to what we do for those who can repay us? Interesting thought, isn't it? So, so, so how does this translate then in Jesus' church, Jesus' modern day church? What would our family dinners, our potluck dinners look like? How, what would be the traditions in Jesus' church? Would they look more like a soup kitchen? Would, uh, would, um, would the traditions be more like, well, before you can bring something, you have to give something away. Before you can bring something to the potluck, first you have to give something away. Or, or, or what, if, if it's, um, what if we have a list of our shut-ins and different ones who, who can't be here and we fill their plates first. And if there's anything left, then we eat. <laughs> it would change the way we look at it, wouldn't it? Come on now, how would you look at potluck dinners then? Would you come? <laughs> if I got to give something away first before I can bring something or, 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 or we're going to take care of those folks out there before we eat, would you even come? Would you prepare twice as much? I mean, come on. I know what it's like. I'm glad town and country's got a deli so I can pick up something before I come. We know what, I know what it's like. As the big crowd gets smaller. Luke 14. 15. Now, when those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to them, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, I put this, uh, I put this verse up here by itself for, for a reason. I think if we were reading through chapter 14, we would probably just... We would read this verse, but probably wouldn't pay that much attention to it. We'd probably just go on and think, well, it's just a verse that's setting up Jesus' next parable, which is probably what it is. But I want us to listen. I, want us to listen. I cannot talk today. Um, 
to what this man is saying, or maybe, maybe I can translate it for you. What he's saying here, he's sitting at this table, he's sitting in the Pharisee's house at the table, and he's saying, us church people sure are blessed that's going to heaven. Us church people, we sure are blessed that's going to heaven. Now, I know that, that this man, the chances are, I'm, I'm sure this man is a Jewish man, and he's talking about the nation, us Jews are going to heaven and we're blessed compared to those who are not. But then we find in verse 16, we find in verse 16, the very next verse, that Jesus turns to this man, this individual. Now I'm sure everybody in the house heard the parable that Jesus next taught, but the Bible says that Jesus turned to this man that made this statement. And he began to tell a parable about a master who had prepared a large banquet. And he invited many people. And, and obviously when you invite people, it's people that you know, right? You wouldn't know to invite them if you didn't know. So it's obviously people that he knew. So, so he told his servant, he said, servant, the banquet is ready. Go out, go out and, and invite the people. Bring them in. Tell them it's ready. These people that we've invited. So the servant first comes to a man who has bought a field. And he said, you know, I bought a field. And I've got to go check out this field. I've got to check out this property. I don't really have time. I don't really have time to come to the banquet. So he, then he goes to the next person. The next person says, you know, I bought five yoke of oxen. And I've got to make sure that, that these oxen are ready to work. You know, I've got people coming in. We're going to plow this field. It's time. I just, I just don't have time to come to the banquet. And then the next person he comes up to, he says, you know, I just got married. And I got to do the family thing. I got to do the family traditional thing. And, and I, I, I just don't have time to come to the banquet. So the servant goes back and tells his master what had happened. And the Bible says that the master was angry. The Bible says the master was angry when he heard the excuses of those whom he invited. So the master said, well, okay. Then go out in the highways and the byways. Go out and just bring in, bring in the poor, bring in the maimed, bring in the blind, bring in the lame. This may not be the people that we might think would come to this fancy banquet, but I want my house full. Bring these people in. So he went out and he did that. And then when he come back in, he sent him out again. He says, I want my house full. So he went in and he brought more. Now, I want us to look at two important points here. The master, the master wanted his house to be full. And those that make excuses will not eat at the banquet. Um, and that's about all I'm going to say in this section <laughs> because I have an emotional investment in this and I want this message to be God's word and not my emotions. But I guarantee you that if, if you were to poll pastors across the board and it doesn't matter what denomination, where they go, all this stuff, it doesn't matter. If you were to say, what are the, what are the top five things that really gets under your skin when it comes to ministry? And within that top five, I can almost guarantee you, within that top five, it'll be excuses and non-commitment, which are the same thing. We make excuses to keep from committing to things. The point is this. When it comes to excuses, the master was angry. And I just want to ask you, if you are, and remember, Remember who he was telling this parable to. If you are confident in your salvation, you may need to ask yourself, how many excuses do you make? As the crowd gets smaller. 
Now in the last section, Jesus has left the Pharisee's house. This previously, this all took place in the Pharisee's house. Jesus has left the Pharisee's house and guess what happens? Here comes this big crowd of people again. He had a way of, of, of attracting large crowds of people. <clears throat> Luke 14, 26 through 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus had, Jesus had it. He had this whole crowd of people following him. And I think that most, especially when you think about being a pastor, most pastors would be like, all right, I got a big church. I got all these people following me. But Jesus said, he turned to those people and he said, listen. If you want to be my disciple... You must leave, love me far more than anything else. Far more than anything else. And you must be committed. Your love, for, your love for me has to far exceed your love for anything else, even your, even your own life. Man, this is tough. This is a tough message. I, I think this whole chapter is leading up to this point. I really do. Jesus said that, that in comparison, when you become my disciple, when you become a follower of me in comparison, that if you had to make a decision between following me and anything else, and he's saying, and, and he's saying kids, he's saying parents, He's saying your family. He's saying your job. He's saying your money. He's saying your house. He's saying everything. If you want to be my disciple, if you had to choose between me and the rest of it, there would be no comparison. There would be, as we say today, it would be a no-brainer that we choose Jesus Christ. Whew. That's tough. That's tough. And like I said, this is not a message from me. Get out Luke 14 and read it. And then Jesus comes up with a couple of illustrations. He says, who's going to build a tower without comparing, without counting the cost? Who's going to go to war without counting the cost? You're not, you're not, a lot of you here, or many of you here has built a house and, and you're not just going to say, well, I'm going to build a house. And let's just start. No, you're going to think how much it's going to cost. You're going to think how much time is going to be involved. You think, you know, all of this, you're, you're, you're going to count the cost. If you're going to go into war, you're going to count the cost. And Jesus says, in comparison, if you're going to follow me first, you better count the cost of what it's going to take. And it's number five. Number five in our sermon notes. Luke 14, 33 through 35. So likewise, <clears throat> whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Does that, does that play in with modern day church? So likewise, whoever who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wow. Jesus says that um, <laughs> Jesus says that a Christian, a Christian without commitment is so worthless to the cause that he deserves being thrown in the manure pile. <laughs> That's, what he said. That's what he says. That's what he says. And guys, you can come on up. You see, I think sometimes, uh, well, just leave it there. I like that. All right, well, you can change it, Steve. 
I think sometimes that we make a mistake when we evangelize. I think sometimes that whenever we, we man, we want people to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Man, we want, we want people, bring people in, into the family. I mean, that's what we want. It's, it's, it's our desire as Christians, or it should be our desire as Christians. But I think sometimes, I think sometimes maybe we do it the wrong way. I'm afraid sometimes we might do it as like we're selling a car. <laughs> you know, come on. We, we tell people, say, you know, we're all born in sin. We're all born in sin. And one of these days, we're, we're all going to die. And when you die, you're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. And heaven is a place of eternity with God. And hell is a place of eternal punishment. And, and, but you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And through His grace, He will enter you and save your life. And... And, and so that way that you, he can, his spirit can fill you and help you through this world. And then when you die, you can spend an eternity with him. And that's wonderful. And that's wonderful. But it also has chrome wheels, leather seats, and a turbo engine. It's just like I, I'm telling you everything that you want to hear. I'm telling you everything that you want to hear. Do we ever, whenever we start to, to introduce people to Jesus Christ... And what a Christian life is, do we ever tell them you better consider the cost? You better consider the cost. Because sometimes, because Jesus said that following me, you've got to put me so far first that nothing else, nothing else compares. Do we, ever, do we ever tell people that? Because we want people to come in and we want people to know Christ as their Savior. We're afraid of telling people that. We're afraid of telling people, you know, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, sometimes it may mean going to prison. Sometimes it may mean losing friends. Sometimes it may mean losing family members that don't want to talk to you anymore if you become a follower of Christ. We don't tell people that, do we? Do we tell people to really consider the cost? You know what we get you know what we get when we, when we introduce people to Jesus Christ without telling them to consider the cost or what the cost might be? We get Christians who are uncommitted. We get Christians who are uncommitted. That when it comes time to, to stand up there and be that Christian, they don't want to do it. This wasn't part of the plan. My plan was getting to live eternity with God. My plan was God hearing my prayers when I go through hard times. And all that is true. But Jesus is telling us that there's a lot more to it than that. Being a follower of Christ means commitment like we've never known before in our lives. Are we willing? <laughs> Have we considered the cost? Have we? I hope we have. I just want to challenge you this morning to think about this and, and, and to get out. Get out Luke 14 and read it. Study it. Man, this is Jesus' teaching. Jesus is the subject. So what are the costs in your life this morning? Is there commitment that's, that's not, uh, maybe not there? What's he working on you? He's, he's working on you. The Holy Spirit's working in your life right now. You know it. I don't have to know it. You know it. What is it? What is he working on you with today? To be that servant? To be that servant of all? To not think of yourself better than anybody else? To be that one who's committed? And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that to be a Christian you've got to sell everything and give it to the church. I'm not one of those, Okay. But it means that God owns everything that I don't own nothing, that God owns everything. And if he calls sometime and needs it, then it's his. Are we there? If not, then we're not truly following the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's not easy. Jesus never, never said that it was easy. But it's worth it. It's worth it be committed. So come this morning if you will. The altar is always open.